Here on the Pandemic Book Club conversation with authors, um, and I call ourselves clubbies. You're my, you're my clubby, I'm your clubby, John, now. I know it means something else at a clubhouse, but I can't think yeah. of any other word. Sock straps and underwear. Yeah. Shirts and <laughs> yeah. I know, don't we miss that? Not Actually, having baseball right now? Yeah, the, the second spells, who would have thunk it that you missed the club? And, and the beautiful dugouts too, after games, you know, how, how, how gorgeous they are with, with, with all the tobacco juice and the sunflower seeds and the bubble gum under your shoes. I know, but obviously we love it. We, we feel right at home in that milieu. So I, I, I do miss it. I know you do too, really. But anyway, if you don't already know, I'm with John Shea. And if you look right behind his head, he's got this gorgeous book there, uh, 24 Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid uh, with a forward by Bob Costas. And if you aren't familiar with uh, John's career, you're in your 33rd year of covering baseball, I think. Um, Award-winning national baseball writer, author of four books. Is this your fourth book or yes. fifth book? Fourth yeah. book. And today, which is May 12th, I'm not sure you're, if you're watching it on May 12th, but today is May 12th, which is John's publication day, which is always really exciting. And um, he, even before today, his book was already number one on Amazon for baseball books. So you got a nice, good running start there, John. Congratulations. No, thanks, Johnny. It's, it's uh, you know, I, who am I, right? I mean, it's Willie Mays. And the <laughs> sit on a tee for him and holds the microphone. But it, just a crazy, wonderful, amazing, stupendous, memorable experience of a lifetime. And I was just cherished and honored and to, to be part of it because yeah, it's, it's, it's new history. Is that a phrase? New history? It's history that has been told. We know a lot of the stories, but Willie says stuff that he hasn't said and all the people around him, same thing. Right. Right. So it, 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 you know, begs the question, when was the first time you met Willie? You mean other ever, than when, ever, ever. Yeah. when you had a convert, when you actually met him? Well, you know, Willie Mays came back to the Giants in 1986. If you remember, uh, Bowie Kuhn threw him out of the game. A wise move by the former commissioner. And luckily, Peter Huberoff came in and said, what are you doing? You, you kicked out Mays and Mantle because they were playing golf with, with clients at casinos. That was the link. So Ubroth was a hero after the 84 Olympics, brought both those two guys back in the game. Big Sports Illustrated cover, welcome back, welcome home. And the, in 1986, Bob Lurie and Al Rosen brought Willie back to the organization. 1988, I came back to the Bay Area, I grew up here and moved to San Diego for school, hung out, worked at a lot of papers, covered the Padres down there. So in 88, I come back, cover the Giants, and Willie's always around, man. I mean, it, 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 just a dream. You watch this guy's as a kid and you know McCovey and Cepeda and Davenport and the Alus and all, the, the clubhouse is just rich with uh, wealth of talent and um, you know Willie Mays topped them all and he always engaged in conversation as you know with reporters not just players and managers and coaches and trainers and owners but but we were the guys who were always there the players came and went the managers came and went but we just hung out as you know, and you and I have gone back to then, and we're still here now. And Mays always thought it was intriguing what we do. And, you know, we, we kind of we laughed it off. Why are you interested in what we do? <laughs> the, the road, what, what's your meat? What's your per diem? And, you know, and all this stuff. And it, yeah, I, I, I watched and listened mostly for all the early years and then struck up conversations with them and uh, you know, I, I, he, he trusted me and th that's, you know, the biggest, one of the biggest things in my life, Willie Mays, trust me, because it, here's a guy who played when there was no agents, there was no free agency, um, there was no union and people took advantage of these guys and they didn't pay him much. His top salary was $165,000. So not until maybe Herman Franks late in the sixties, 
did he get some real sound financial advice and he bought a home 1970-ish that he still lives at now, it's beautiful. And, uh, you know, so all these years later, and, you know, in his, in his 40s and the 50s and the 60s and the 70s, you know, it's post, post baseball, but he's still a kid at heart. And that just came across in every conversation we ever had. So 15 years ago, I asked him about a book. And he says, I'd like to see a book in classrooms. Bingo. So all inspiration, uh, like you said, life stories and life lessons. And, you know, he's, he, he wants to do something for young folks who didn't see him play, who maybe don't know about him, and, um, which he did all the time as a player. I talked to Joe Morgan. I talked to all these young players who, who's, you know, Willie took, uh, you know, un under his wing and uh, guided them. And, uh, and I, I thought that was a perfect story. And as it, as it happens, it's coming out at a time where uh, maybe people need some inspiration. Well, that's for sure. But I want to go a little deeper into the process because that fascinates me. There's been a lot of Willie Mays books out there, right? And you got access, not only, I know, you, you got a few of them back there. Yeah. Um, access, not just to him, but to his whole circle. Mm -hmm. So going back to when you first um, got to know him and you said he trusted you, how do you know he trusted you? How did you know that? Because he kept talking to me. Yeah, and, you know, just I, you. Like, yeah, you guys yeah. would have one-on-ones. Yeah. So I wrote a lot about him in 2000 when the Examiner and Chronicle merged. Um, you know, Henry Shulman and I were at competing papers. Then when we merged, there were two of us. So Henry continued on as a Giants beat writer, which he wanted to do. And I moved over to a uh, national baseball writer. And that was an opportunity to really step back and admire things from afar and really dig into different stories and ideas and personalities and while you know henry you know w was focused on the team um you know we collaborated we you know, had a great partnership over the years but this opportunity allowed me to to talk to fellas like Mays a little bit more and engage in conversation a little bit deeper and one thing led to the next and I'm calling him at home and you know, he's picking up and he's talking about it, this story or that story. And as a national baseball writer of the San Francisco Chronicle, you're not gonna talk to Willie Mays or at least try. So I was fortunate or lucky or whatever you wanna call it. And gaining that trust is, is everything because maybe there are a lot of people he couldn't or didn't trust and you know, people try to take advantage of people and he knows that um, to this day. So he's, he does have an inner circle of friends. Obviously, there's great trust there. And I, don't, I, I got to know a lot of them, and they're all great people, uh, his assistants, his attorneys. But, you know, they're all his friends. And they hang out with them, and they engage in conversation with them. And that's Willie's favorite thing to do. It's not just engaging with us or the ballplayers. When he's up at his suite above, you know, the ballpark looking over the field, you know, he invites Little League teams in or high school teams in. And it's not, you know, hey, there's Willie Mays, can I get his autograph? Willie goes to them and say, hey, you know, what position do you play? You know, how do you grip the bat? You know, how, how, how do you hold the ball? Um, you know, are you good? Right. <laughs> <And these> kids, <laughs> uh, wow. Because <laughs> they, they've been, uh, they've been uh, they, they know all about them because their parents, uh, you know, explained who this guy was that they're about to meet. And, uh, but Willie loves that. He still loves that. He still loves being a player, the Say Hey Kid and aptly named. So when you first started to germinate this idea for a book, even after all these other books had been written, what was your original thought? The, what did you think the book would be if he said yes, before he gave you his, his mm -hmm. ideas? Well, it's a great question. Uh, I had all kinds of ideas and that led to all kinds of proposals and all kinds of titles. Um, give us, uh, give, give me some examples. An Amazing Life, M-A-Y-S. Publisher said, uh, yeah, next. Um, <laughs> even though it was May, so you, you come up with a better title than that. <laughs> and, uh, you know, so I, I was thinking maybe a lifetime, you know, pers you know perspective, um, look look see you know deeper dive whatever you want to call it and but then how it, would it and how would it be different from what was already out there well yeah that's what i that was the goal to try to do that um 
and uh, yeah, I, I, literally there, there might have been five or seven different ideas to, to move forward, um, you know, before Willie dropped that on me. And that was 15 years ago. So there's been a lot of time to develop. You know, he was 74, 75 years old. And, you know, I want to see this in classrooms. So it was easy to go that way. But we didn't even get the title till two, three years ago because mm -hmm. we didn't. It just all came together. Kurt Aguilar, uh, former copy editor at the Chronicle, former copy editor at the San Jose Mercury, lifetime Willie Mays fan and historian, baseball historian. He used to kid me all the time. I wrote about Mays so often at the Chronicle. He would say, on days I didn't, like I was covering the Warriors or the A's. He said, John <laughs> you know, he used to razz me about it. <laughs> and I said, well, sorry, man, tomorrow. Um, so he was so invaluable. You know, as was Brad Mangin on the, uh, you know, the, the picture side. Uh, there's 90 plus pictures, most of them rare, uh, a lot of them never seen before. And that's the whole idea of this book. There's no bibliography. And that, that, was, that was maybe the difference maker. I said, Let, let's make this all organic and genuine and real and true and not borrow anything from any other book that has ever been written. No, no newspaper, magazine, um, microfiche, remember that? Yeah. Anything that written about Willie in quotes, dismiss him. Let's get all new information. You know, spent 100 hours plus with Willie on this project. Spent time with uh, 200 people in interviews for this project. So it was a lot of time. And you, you know, you going back the whole process, a lot of people have passed. Um, you know, people I spoke with, Alvin Dark, you know, Willie McCovey, Peter McGowan, Frank Robinson, Johnny Antonelli, um, many more. Al, Al Rosen. Mm, yeah, Al Rosen, who was on uh, first base when Willie made the catch in 54. It's just unbelievable that these people tell me these stories and I say, I just never heard that. And why haven't I heard that? Um, well, people maybe just rely on what they said 50 years ago to tell the story. And too many newspaper stories, online stories, books have been written with the same old stuff. And I just won't, didn't want, you know, Willie to be remembered by stuff he said such a long time ago. I want him to be remembered for what he said now. In retrospect, he's looking back on an entire life, an entire career. And that's what all these other people are doing. And that's, that's a fascinating part about this. It's all, it's all new. There's no bibliography. It's all exclusive material that, um, you know, just for this book and the photography and the storytelling that just blows my mind that, that I was able to have access to all this. So take us in the room. Where did you do most of your interviews with him? At his home. Um, we so, did. So take us there. What, what was the room like? Where were you sitting? Where was he sitting? How did you... And, and how did you, like, even for, like, journalists who were watching this, right, saying, well, how do you develop a rapport in which a man who has been asked a gazillion questions about himself for a gazillion years, how do you get fresh, you know, fresh mm -hmm. answers? That's a good one. Um, yeah, of the 100 plus hours, it was probably at least 70 at his home. Um, also spent time at his house in Scottsdale. I spent time in a suite at the ballpark. Um, I spent time with him, all, all kinds of different private functions from, um, you know, back when the uh, Scouts dinner uh, at Beverly Hills, every December, Dennis Gilbert hosts this, you know, fantastic party for charity and auction. And Mays was honored one year and he said, well, I'm gonna bring my, uh, you know, uh, all, all the surviving teammates from the 1948 Black Barons, and there were four of them. So I was able to hang out with them, and Willie invites me into his hotel suite with these guys. And I, I just sat in the back and just listened to these guys talk like they were 25 playing in Birmingham, and the game's tomorrow, and who we, who we face. Mm -hmm. and it, it brings tear, tears in my eyes. And, you know, I, I was able to hang out with Willie and Vince Scully during – Scully's last uh, weekend, and it was in San Francisco. Remember when Mays went up there? Well, I was, you know, I looked around. I said, hey, there's no other media folks here. And I was, I'm here. And, and that was cool. Uh, when Bob Costas interviewed Willie and Hank after uh, the New York Yankee All-Star game, um, the next day at NYU, 
he did a big HBO interview and I was in the green room with Willie and Hank and just watching my manners and listening. And I said, man, this is fantastic. And then I'm a little kid, but I'm also chronicling and, and reporting and recalling and doing all those things that, because so many years ago, I thought about a book. So I, I said, I'm gonna do all the interviews I can um, just, just in case it happens. And now that it happened, I had, you know, have everything, you know, in tapes and, I mean, those little tiny cassette tapes it goes that far back in the process. Yeah, 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 I remember those. I said, please still work, luckily. But at his house, yeah, I'm, I'm sitting at a, you know, we, we, we might be in the living room or in a back room, mostly in a back room. And, what's, the, uh, what's the back room? Well, um, you know, he's got all kinds of, you know, personal stuff in there, kind of a private quarters. It's not, you know, the public area where people might visit, where he's got trophies and pictures and, it's just kind of his uh, hangout and um, where he could do what he wants, you know. And, and what's uh, in there? Well, he's got, you know, uh, some old pictures and, um, you know, just stuff. Nothing, nothing that you'd be, you know, stunned about. Um, you know, he doesn't have any gold gloves. He's got no baths. I asked him one day because I was doing a story on the five tools a story. I was doing a, a chapter on the five tools and it was, it's a whole first person how to. You know, Willie on hitting, Willie on hitting for power, Willie on running, uh, fielding, throwing, how I did it and how you should do it. And I said, well, Willie, do you have a bat? I'd love to talk about, you know, the, how you hold the, the handle. I said, no. I said, what? You don't have a house? This is a big house. You got everything else. Well, how about a glove? I said, no gloves. So why not? I said, people took them. I said, what? It's the same as when I was a player. People borrowed my glove and they never gave it back. They took my bat and they never gave it back same thing now so Willie Mays has no bats or gloves at his home wow. <laughs> but, well next time I'll bring my own so I brought my glove and my whole bat I said here Willie hold the bat here Willie hold my glove so <laughs> I don't think I've touched that stuff since I uh, got home but uh, <laughs> and that that was the, the thing with Willie he's so gracious with his time and access Joni every time I plan for two hours okay I'll be there Sunday from 12 to 2 never was it less than five sometimes wow. and those hours add up and by the end we're just kind of you know talking about whatever and one time I was there he was talking with Hank Aaron on the phone you know, <laughs> and I said and another time we're watching tv and the hall of fame voting results appear and I'm sitting with like the greatest player who ever lived and what's he thinking about these guys who are getting more votes than he did <laughs> 23 people didn't vote for him, Joni. I know, I saw that in your book. I couldn't believe it. There, there should be a list, you know, pounded on somebody's door that, you know, the list of shame there. Yeah, and nobody admitted to it. And, you know, one person didn't vote for Jarek Jeter and it's the crime of the century. Well, what about me and these other guys who weren't unanimous? Yeah, exactly. Well, John, because you spent so much time with him in his home, were there moments when he he became a guy named Willie? You know that the that the conversation was so personal and easy that he was no longer oh my God Willie Mays. Yeah, you know he'd ask me about my family and stuff, and um, you know you 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 played right, you know like uh, not 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 like you did, but you know we all played a little. Uh, um, you know, where's, where's your daughter going to school? Uh, what's he think, what, what's she thinking about colleges? That's one regret for Willie Mays. Um, one of very few, I didn't go to college. You know, I, I couldn't, you know, where I came from. That's, that's why I, I told Barry Bonds, you're going to college. You know, when the Gi Giants drafted him after, uh, after he grad you know, graduated from Sarah High School, the Giants drafted him and offered him, you know, not much compared to what they make today, but Willie and, Willie's, uh, uh, Barry's dad, Bobby, said, hey, you're going to school. So Barry went to school for three years and then went to the Pirates. But uh, yeah, it, it's, uh, it's, it's an amazing experience when I'm just sitting there. And a couple of times he's called me a friend. Mm. And, and, um, and I said, wow, you know, one time on the air with Greg Papa, the old Chronicle Live. What? 
I'm, I'm in Murph's office in the Giants clubhouse and Papa comes in. He said, say, hey, when are you going to be on Cron Live with me? And Willie looks at him and says, I'll go on if John joins me. And I said, oh, okay. And Papa said, sure, you know. If we got to bring him, okay. If it means getting you, we'll bring that guy too. So, you know, a couple of weeks later, I'm on Cron Live. And it's just wonderful. It's supposed to go an hour, went 90 minutes. Papa had it all organized. We're going over all five tools. And uh, so he called me a friend there. He's called me a friend, you know, at his home. And it's just a special thing. And it's like, I, you know, I don't go telling people that. I guess I just told you, you asked, but um, how cool is that, Joni? It, 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 you know, it's one of those things that I imagine you can't really get your arms around because, you know, you're growing up and you're watching this guy and he's, he's beyond. And now all of a sudden there's this intimate relate, not all of a sudden, but over time there's this intimate relationship and I would imagine writing this book, your, your bar was really, really high and wanted to um, do justice to this yep. man who has given you so much time. So what was the writing process like with that, you know, big backpack on your, on your back carrying? Yeah, because I cared. It, um, publisher wanted it long ago. And no, it's got to be done right. We got to go 24 deep. Um, we can't run into like, I get Hank Aaron, you know, and I got Hank Aaron. And I said, this is not a chapter. This is a book. You know, <laughs> about Willie and Willie about Hank. That's one chapter. Okay. Um, and then, you know, I, 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 I got Bill Clinton early on and I said, you know, I'd, I'd really like to get George W. Bush because I, I just wanted, you know, the far left, you know, San Francisco writer. He only talks to these guys. And luckily, you know, I got George W. Bush. So it's a real nice balance. And even the pictures, if you, if you check out the end papers, the, the front inside covers, the back inside covers. I love them. Democrat and Republican. A Democrat and Republican on that, on that first inside cover. You yeah. got Rick and you got Obama. And then if you flip back to the end of the book, you might see Bush and Clinton. So it's kind of even Stephen. Um, yeah. You know, right down the middle. And when I talk to these guys, same thing. It's not like I was talking to a Democrat or Republican, far left, far right. It was enjoying a beer at a bar and talking baseball and Willie Mays for 40 minutes apiece. Wow. So how do you call up a Barack Obama? Yeah, well, I, I went through their foundations. You know, every, every president has a foundation. And, you know, if you work at the New York Times or the Chronicle or the LA Times or any newspaper, the Mercury, the Chicago Tribune, and want to get a hold of somebody like that, you go through the foundation and you fill out the form, you know, um, media requests, uh, you know, fill in the blanks what your name is, what, what you want to uh, find out, uh, what, what you're inquiring about. And, uh, you know, they ignore you. And then months go by and you do it again and they ignore you. And weeks go by, you do it again. And then finally you, you get, oh, okay, what's this for? And then you explain it and said okay let me check on that and i knew that both clinton and bush their childhood heroes was willie mays with bush he has this great quote i never want to be president i want to be willie mays <laughs> and when bill clinton was 10 years old his family you know both these presidents by the way first baby boomer presidents born in the summer of 46 right after the war and so they're the same age and they both grow up in the south and Clinton, when he's 10, his parents buy a black and white TV. And one of the first images he sees is Willie Mays running across the screen. And he says, oh, my God. And then he put, becomes president, invites him to the White House. They become friends and golf partners. And, and the same thing with George Bush. Uh, when he was, you know, mid-50s, same thing with Clinton. Because, you, know, um, you know, Willie in New York through 57. So in those years, in the mid-50s, uh, George W. Bush goes to, you know, the, the family property in Connecticut and his dad's younger brother, Bucky, brings him to the Polo Grounds for his first big league game. And there's Willie Mays running across the field. And then he becomes president and invites Willie to the White House and they become friends. And, and uh, so, <laughs> you know, 
when you and I as reporters leave messages for people to call back and you leave 10 you, and you get five people calling back, you had a great day. <laughs> now well, that's batting 500. With Mays, I'm batting like a thousand. You know, hey, it's, it's for a Willie Mays book. You know, okay, we'll get, we'll get back to you. Everyone has a Willie Mays story. It doesn't matter if you're a president, an artist, or a musician, uh, um, a Hall of Famer, uh, you know, Negro Leaguer, uh, childhood, but everybody's got a Mays story. Was there anything in your conversations? I mean, obviously, a lot of it ended up in the book, but were there moments that you will just forever remember that were maybe, you know, not about the book, um, you know, and other than him calling you a friend, were there, there are conversations that you would go home and tell your wife about, like, hmm. oh my God, today, you know, we talked about this and, and something that maybe you learned about him um, as he started to peel away any of those layers. About Willie uh, or about others, about Willie? No, about him. Uh, about himself and, and um, you know, just something that you went home and you just said, I know this has nothing to do with the book, but I got to tell you this. Oh. Um, I don't know. That's a good question. Maybe stuff we saw on TV, uh, phone calls he got. Bill Clinton called him the other day, the day after his birthday. And, uh, <laughs> you know, I, I was over at his house the day right before that. And the amount of phone, it's like every old ball player I mentioned, did he call? Yeah, he called. Did this guy call you? <laughs> you see the cake? Say again? Did, did you see his birthday cake? No. Uh, go to Dennis O'Donnell's uh, uh, Twitter feed. Um, okay. He's, <laughs> Dennis O'Donnell uh, took a picture of Willie's cake. Uh -huh. uh, you got to see it. You, you want to call it up? Uh, can I on this? It was not oh, going to show, though. Yeah, I thought you might. Anyway, his cake is the book, the book cover. Oh, wow. Yeah. So I, 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 I knew Willie loved the project. He was engaged throughout. Every word that I sent, he needed to know about. He never told me not to write something, but he wanted to make sure it was properly presented, Willie Mays and John Shea co-authors. So there were parts of it that weren't funny enough. He said, John, this, this is a little stale. You gotta up the tempo here. Come on, man, make it funny. That's a funny story I told you. I said, okay, Willie, I'll, let me try that again. Um, the other, other moments in his career that I might've left out, uh, you know, you, you forgot to mention this, that there was a key hitter you overlooked. And it's like, darn, that's, that's some heavy stuff because, uh, you know, you talk to Charles Barkley and you know, how, what do you think of your book, Charles? Well, I didn't read it, you know. And, <laughs> and with Willie, it really mattered to him that it's presented the right way. I mean, this is a legacy book and this is his life through storytelling and lessons shared. And he didn't want it to be pushed through too quickly. Um, there were times that, you know, we, we struggled. We said, well, we, you know, um, we're not sure about this chapter. How should we combine them? And it was cool that every chapter has a lesson from Willie Mays. It tops off with a Willie Mays lesson of two or three sentences, um, you know, and, and which, which goes with the theme of every chapter. So there's so many things to this, Joan, that, uh, that it's, it's just, it, it, it's really amazing. The photography and the, the access and the storytelling and the history unfolded that make it um, so precious in my mind, even if it doesn't sell one book. Yeah, and the characters that you capture you know, from this huge span of time and people's names that sometimes, you know, for those of us who aren't baseball historians might not know, and we get to discover them in that book. And there is a lot of humor. I mean, and that's what we love about sports, isn't it, John? You know, the way these guys and women on their teams connect with each other, you know, and the whole thing, you know, why I was so interested in team chemistry 
is you just, everything is about relationship. And, and that's what kept occurring to me as I read your book with Willie Mays. It was all about his relationships across the board. And one I'm particularly interested in, of course, is with Barry Bonds, mm -hmm. his relationship with Barry Bonds. And if you stood them, you know, together and their personalities and how they lived their life, you know, in their careers, opposite ends of the spectrum, right? I mean, Willie was as, as popular as you could get with his own teammates and fans and, and Bonds, not as much. And I know you had a very, you know, um, meaningful, in-depth conversation with Barry about Willie's influence on him. Having heard both of them talk about each other, what was Willie's influence on Barry? <laughs> Well, it didn't start with Barry. It started with Bobby, his dad. You know, Willie was not just Barry's mentor, but Bobby's mentor. And, mm. you know, the pressure that Bobby Bonds felt as the next Willie Mays, it, it was just almost too much to take. You know, Bobby Mercer was the next Mickey Mantle. It's so unfair. And Willie never forgot that. He never saw what it did to Bobby. Bobby could do it all. He could do stuff that, you know, Mays could do. He could do all the five tools. He did 30-30 all the time. Mm -hmm. And uh, there are two people in history who've gone 30 homers, 30 steals five times. And, and the last name for both of them is Bonds, you know? So he, he was a wonderful all-around ball player. But there were some pressures. You know, okay, Mays is traded to the Mets. Now it's, now it's your turn, Bobby. So anyway, we all know how, you know, Bobby – Rejoined the Giants when his son did in 93. Peter McGowan brought them both to San Francisco. And that was kind of nice. You know, the, the Bonds' relationship struggled over the years. And it was nice to see them together um, in a mostly uh, positive manner. Won the coach and first base coach. Uh, won the superstar player who came home. Now, you know, years later, Bobby got sick. And before he died, Willie went over to the hospital and at Bobby's deathbed, Willie told me, Bobby said, look out for Barry. He's the one guy, you're the one guy that he will listen to. And Barry said the same when, when you know, it goes back to Barry's, you know, five years old before, you know, before Mays is traded. Barry's a five-year-old kid just, you know, clowning around in the clubhouse and stealing Mays's bubble gum and following him out to center field and trying to throw like him. And, and, and Barry said he, every time he tried to make the basket catch, he fell over. And <laughs> you know, he just idolized this guy. You know, as, 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 and, and Willie said, of all the Bonds brothers, uh, Barry's the one guy who was like glue on me. <laughs> and so Willie took him under his wing. You know, five-year-old, what are you going to do? Um, so anyway, Bobby dies, and Willie never forgot that. Willie never said a bad word about Bobby. Willie never said a bad word about Barry. Yeah. People have tried to get him to say it. You know, I certainly asked him uh, all I could, but you know, it 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 was something that Bobby told him to do, and Willie honored the request from Barry's dad: take care of my kid. So, you know, now you have Belco and the steroid scandal and the chase of you know Willie Mays, the chase of Hank Aaron, uh, not to mention Babe Ruth. And Barry's passing all these guys and getting ridiculed. And he's the bigger story than the team itself. And the team is struggling. And, uh, you know, the clubhouse is out of control. And as we know now, you know, with the, you know, the many in the clubhouse were in the Mitchell report. Um, yeah, you know, mostly through Balco means. Um, and that was true on both sides of the Bay with Oakland and San Francisco. So, you know, through it all, Mays was there for Barry. And, you know, I tried to tell that story through Willie's words and Barry's words and talk about the meaning, meaningful relationship. And to this day, Barry says the biggest home run he ever hit was the one that equaled Willie at 660. Not surpassed Willie, but equaled Willie. And of course, Willie comes down on the field and literally hands over a torch <laughs> at the, you know, from, from the old, you know, the, the Olympic relay that they were involved in. And, um, so never let that relationship, uh, you know, turn sour. 
despite all the reports, despite all the criticisms that Barry was getting, Willie was the one guy in his corner. And I saw him time after time at Barry's locker, time after time huddling with him in Murph's office. I even saw one time in the middle of the room, Barry's getting stretched out by Willie Mays in the middle of the clubhouse. And so that it, Barry didn't listen to everybody, but he listened to Willie Mays. Yeah, and it's like Dusty says in your book that um, Willie always told Barry the truth. Hmm. So I mean, talk about trust, right? You know, he really trusted. So were you, you know, and you covered Barry Bonds, you know, through thick and thin, right? Did you have a uh, maybe a more nuanced view of Barry Bonds because now you could see him through Willie's eyes? Yes. And, you know, Barry's telling me things like, you know, I, 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 that was just me. That was my personality. There were times where Willie told me, he said, Hey, be cool, you know, be chill, uh, you know, be kind, um, respect the game, not respect the game, respect the media. Um, Cause Barry always respected the game in terms of playing the game. People said, well, maybe he didn't respect the game in ter terms of what happened with Belko, but in terms of, actually appreciating history and honoring, you know, the, the, the folks before him. He was always a student in the game and there was never a better interview in my mind when talking to a baseball player on how the game, you know, uh, ought to be played through, you know, in the nineties, there was no better go-to guy than Barry Bonds, you know, before the whole Belko mess uh, erupted, he would sit and talk, you know, for hours with you about, about the game, about himself, about, um, nuances and, and all this stuff. And it's just, just, you know, wonder, wonderful interviews that I recall, you know, that all mostly went away when, you know, 700 people crammed into the clubhouse from all over the globe, you know, to the chronicle the chase. But uh, yeah, I, I kind of appreciated uh, things a little bit more and Willie tried to change him a little bit. And, you know, sometimes Barry would listen and sometimes he wouldn't, but Barry or Willie did say, I gave him a space, you know, I wasn't on him every day. I didn't call him every day. You know, he's a grown man. He can do what he wants. But I'm here to, you know, do what his father told me and look out for him and be there if he needs me. So um, just to end it with, um, you know, as a journalist, and, and as I said earlier, I think there will be, you know, a lot of, you know, writers who want to hear what you have to say. And, and you've always been able to, John, you know, we, uh, we, we call you Columbo in the uh, in the clubhouse. You're the guy. Now, now that one more thing, um, you have a way of getting people to tell you stuff. So, what advice? What interviewing advice would you give to journalists to number one build trust with a subject, and number two? have a rapport and ask the kinds of questions that elicit um, things that they haven't told other people? Don't be a know-it-all. Listen, uh, learn, respect, appreciate. And when, when um, you know, don't, don't, don't pop off about yourself. Nobody wants to hear about you. Don't be the story. Nick Peters, a longtime beat writer of the Giants, said you aren't the story man and, you know a lot of writers they are the story uh especially in today's world and you know there's a line that maybe you shouldn't cross but um patience you know all, all these things that uh you you got to understand that um like um you know, if buster posey doesn't sign an autograph one day that that kid or parents going to remember it forever and I remember one time he didn't sign an autograph outside Ridley Field and a dad and his son were there and his dad wrote a big piece for the New York Times and absolutely ripped into Buster Posey and then I wrote a follow-up story explaining that dude don't force your kid on on Buster Posey Buster Posey will sign for a kid but not when you're there holding a sign that says Buster for president and he just lost a tough game against the Cubs. If he doesn't want to sign, he, you know, and this is the guy who got a whole bunch of other autographs. So 
you know, you gotta, you gotta give them their space. I mean, it's not football. It's not once a week. It's not basketball or twice or three times a week. It's every freaking day. And the preparation and the mindset and, and getting ready for a game, is just not easy. The, it, it's, it's so mental. You know, the fifth, the sixth tool, like the, the chapter says with Willie Mays. So it's, so yeah, I basically re respect them and, you know, don't, uh, don't act like you're, you're bigger than them or bigger than the story because you're just there to tell the story. Right. And, and like you are the, the poster, poster boy for this is that you play the long game. You know, when you're in baseball, a lot of these people are going to be around a long time. And so it's developing relationships over time if it doesn't happen today or tomorrow or next year or two years from now. But like you said, you know, just having a rapport and a respectful relationship can get you a long way. And, you know, it got you, it got you this amazing book and I bet you're just thrilled um, to have it and have your name on a book right next <laughs> to Willie Mays. Seriously, John, it's a, it's a real triumph and, you know, a testament to incredible persistence and delicacy and nuance in how you go about um, talking to people and, and gathering information from so many different people. Um, the other thing I wanted to get into, but I won't have time for, is um, how did you organize all your material? Because my goodness, that's a lot of interviews. It's a lot of research. Yeah. And I think we're going to have to do another one. Another yeah. one of these, John. Same time next week. How about that? Yeah, right. You know, I got the stacks of papers that written and rewritten and rewritten and rewritten. And the chapters, you know, they, they came together at the end, but certainly it didn't at the beginning. And a you know, labor of love, because every word you're spending so much time on, every sentence, you, you just want to have the perfect book because, you know, Willie wants this in classrooms. So I said, okay, if the kids are going to read this, it better be accurate, it better be good, and it better be lively. And like you said, funny in some spots. And it's got to be genuine and true and accurate and factual. And luckily, I have baseball reference in retrosheet.org or and uh, you know the the numbers with the, being able to call you know Bill James or or Rob Nyer or Eno Saris and you know Tom Tango all these fantastic people who know everything about the analytics that are over my head um, you know agree to contribute you know to that chapter and you know I have doctors and uh, um, you know in another chapter that that tell you know, t tell the story of Willie's fainting over the years and why you know, why, why he had these blackouts and episodes uh, based on, you know, through the lens of today's um, research and right. expertise. And that was the beauty of it. It wasn't just going back in history. It was, it's, it was applying uh, methods of today, analytics of today, teachings of today to, to Willie's world back in the 40s and 50s and 60s and so on. You covered it all, John, and uh, congratulations again. And I hope everybody goes out today, well, not goes out, goes to their laptop today or their phone <laughs> and order 24 Life Stories and Lessons from the Say Hey Kid by Willie Mays and John Shea. Thanks, John.